Good morning. Uh, this morning's scripture reading will be from the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 6, 1 through 9. These are the commands, decrees, and laws of the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess, so that you, your children, and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all of his decrees and commands that I give you, and so that you may enjoy a long life. Hear, O Israel, and be careful to obey so that it may go well with you and that you may increase greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your fathers, promised. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads and write them on your door frames of your house and on your gates. We all said amen. Good morning, church. All right, let's just lay this down here. Let the church say amen. Amen. Let the church say amen again. Let the church say amen one more time. Amen. Amen. I'm excited to be here this morning to present to you a portion of God's word. And many of you may know and some may not know that I am the family minister. My name is Joshua Dubois, and I am the family minister. And some of you have come to me asking, what does that mean? Well, I'm still trying to figure that out. Sort of. Uh, Okay, I don't know what I just hit. Oh, there we go. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so I want to answer the question this morning of what is the family ministry. And some of you may be familiar with it. Some of you may not really know what it is. Um, You may have certain ideas and expectations of me and the family ministry. Uh, And I just want to kind of help iron those things out and make this ministry much more um, transparent to you so you know exactly what my role is here as the family minister. Um, So I want to tell you that what family ministry is not. Family ministry is not another ministry fragmented into its own domain with separate programs and activities. Family ministry is also not a solve-all for family and church-related problems. Okay, I may have some of the answers, but definitely not all of the answers. So let's talk about what family ministry is. Who can identify the group of superheroes on the screen? Who are those people? The Fantastic Four, that is correct. The Fantastic Four. So I want to give you the Fantastic Fours of family ministry. And uh, we're going to talk about what I believe to be fundamental concepts of family ministry. And this message has been compiled of a study from two books. Uh, One of the books is called Family Ministry Field Guide, and the other book is The DNA of D6. So I read both these books, and of course, with my own knowledge and experience with with youth and family ministry, and also being a a marriage and family therapist, um, these are the the ideas and a brief snapshot, if you will, of what family ministry is. So we're going to talk about how family ministry is acknowledging, family ministry is equipping, family ministry is discipling, and family ministry is evangelizing. So we'll just get right into it. So acknowledging, what does family ministry acknowledge? Well, family ministry is acknowledging the fact that parents and caregivers are primarily responsible for discipling their children. If we look back at the scripture reading this morning in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9, I'll just read it for emphasis sake. 
Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, or with all your might. And then he says, these commandments that I give to you today are to be on your hearts. <clears throat> then he says, teach them or impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit down at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. God was trying to let the children of Israel know through Moses that parents are responsible for imparting truths about God. Furthermore, about spirituality, about Christianity, about having a relationship with the transcendent higher being known as God. And that word impress or teach diligently in the Hebrew is a very interesting word. It's pronounced shanan, which means to pierce, which means sharp, which means to, to cut deeply, to penetrate, to prick. So when we think about that in light of God's word, in, a, in light of parents being the primary disciple makers in their home, then when it comes to imparting or impressing God's word into our children, the Bible does say that the word of God is a double-edged sword. I believe this is a double-edged sword, right, Joel? Feels like it, looks like it. We'll just say it's a double-edged sword. So if this is the word of God, that as parents, we hold God's word within our hearts, and we ought to impress them unto our children. And I believe what God is trying to get across to the children of Israel, to the parents, is that when it comes to impressing or penetrating God's word, it ought not to result in a superficial relationship with God. In other words, the word is not supposed to just uh, superficially lay on the minds of our children. It has to penetrate the skin, penetrate to the organs of our children. So what do you mean? Well, the word of God is to have an effect on the heart, on the brain, on the mind, on the lifestyle of our children. And it is up to parents to instill these principles into our children. Oftentimes, we've fallen to the belief that it is the church's responsibility to equip the children, to disciple children, to make sure that our children have a spiritual relationship with God. We put that burden on the preacher, on the youth minister, maybe on the family minister, on the Bible school teachers, but that's just not so. What we do in the corporate assembly should be an extension of what is already being done in the home. That looks really good right about now, doesn't it? <clears throat> so the idea is this. As we think about parents acknowledging them as the primary disciple makers of their children, parents are to provide the full course meal of Christianity to their children. In other words, that parents give their children everything that they need when it comes to spirituality, when it comes to living out your relationship with God in the context of the home. So parents provide their children with every essential portion, if you will. And in the church setting, in the corporate setting, when we come together for worship, for Bible class, Sunday morning Bible school, the church is simply a supplement to the meal that the children are already getting at home. So the church supplements the nutrition that may be lacking from the full course meal at home. But a lot of times we have this switched around. 
And we believe that the church is responsible for providing the entire spiritual meal to our children. Not so. Parents have mistakenly believed that discipleship of children is simply bringing their children to church. And I used to think that way. You'd be surprised at how many parents I run into. And they say, oh yeah, we grew up in a Christian home. Yes, my parents were believers. Also, we'll give me an example of what that means. We went to church every Sunday. That's it. Well, just going to church doesn't make you a Christian. Amen? Any more than standing in a garage makes you a car. It has to be more than that. It has to be deeper than that. But we've adopted this belief that just bringing our children into a spiritual environment is, is where our job ends. And that is so far from the truth. Parents mistakenly believe that discipline is managing a child's behavior. Parents mistakenly believe that success is measured by material possessions, education, excelling at extracurricular activities and programs. To decrease pain and suffering, we feel as parents, if we're doing these things, we're doing a pretty good job. But it's deeper than that. Parents mistakenly believe that children ought to be happy, well-paid adults, and so we raise them that way totally neglecting the spiritual aspect of their lives. When it comes to providing a safe, fun, happy, successful life for our children, I wonder how well would Abraham agree with you? Think about the communion and the way that Joel prepared our minds for that, going back to Abraham and Isaac. Abraham knew that in order to please God, that he had to impress some spiritual teachings into his son. A little radical, a little extreme, yes. But nonetheless, Isaac learned something that day that will follow him for the rest of his life. And he didn't learn this through joy and happiness in providing him for success of this world. He learned this through pain, through suffering. It's not always about providing our children with what makes them happy, but it's providing them with the teachings of God which they may not agree with. Amen? When God's plan for the family is broken... Parents receive the idea that their responsibilities end with protecting their children, providing for their children, and teaching their children to make decisions that will lead to a more successful, happy life. I encourage you to revisit the story of Hannah and Samuel to help this point make more sense. I encourage you to revisit the story of, of Noah. Noah and the ark and how his children had to sacrifice much of their life in assisting their father in building this ark. Parents are providing their children with everything these days except for what is eternally important. And I'm here to encourage parents to create a more Christ-centered home. When you look at Mark chapter 8, verse 36, we're all familiar with this, with this verse. It says, For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and what? And lose or forfeit his own soul? It's a rhetorical question that Jesus asks. Well, I want to manipulate this, manipulate the scripture just a little bit. And I want to ask the question, what does it profit a parent to teach his or her children how to gain the whole world? when he or she fails to teach them how not to forfeit their own soul. 
It's time for us to re-examine our priorities for our children, church. Not only do we acknowledge that parents and caregivers are the primary disciple makers of the home, but there is an equipping aspect of family ministry. Equipping. Unfortunately, the church has done too much replacing and not enough equipping. So what do you mean, Brother Josh? Well, ministers have now replaced the role of parents. Well, parents have said that the minister is the person who is responsible for creating a Christian worldview in my child. It's not my problem. It's the minister's problem. And so the minister is charged with that responsibility. Number two, programs have replaced the parent and child interaction and family worship. Where the church has been so busy doing things and having activities and programs that there's no time for family ministry in the home. And if you noticed, uh, Joe and I, we work together and we try to come up with ideas and ways to make sure uh, the programs and activities that, that exist, that they do have a family aspect. That they do uh, bring the family together for spiritual teachings and interactions. Equipping means that uh, too much energy has been put into curriculum and guest speakers. Well, we think that, well, if we had the right speaker, families would be on board. If we had the right youth minister or the right family minister, that things would just work out the way it's supposed to. That if we had the, the, the correct curriculum, that all the problems will be solved. I think that's the wrong mindset to have because then we start to idolize people and materials. And they supersede the will of God and the plan that he's already laid out for families. The job of the minister, the job of the youth minister, the job of the family minister is to equip the saints for ministry. We don't do the job for you. We give you the tools and the resources so you can do the job yourselves. Some of you are looking at me mighty funny. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 12, it says this. And he gave some as apostles, and some as prophets, and some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers. Look at verse number 12. For the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ. The minister's job is not to do all the work. Our job is to equip you for your personal ministry. And I believe the first ministry that every believer has is the ministry within their own home. And I want to help you do that ministry. I want to help you be successful in that ministry. Some of you have received a questionnaire, an assessment, a survey when I first arrived here. And I've gotten about half of those back. And this survey was sent out to, I believe, 50 families right here in the Mesa Church. And I got about 25 of those surveys back. And this is what the data revealed. So one of the questions on the survey was, how many times in the last year has any church leader made, a, made contact with me to help me engage actively with my child's spiritual development? And here are the results. 57% said never. Twenty-three percent said a couple of times. Fourteen percent said once. This ought not to be. And it's because the church leaders and ministers have taken responsibility away from the parents. It is the church's job to equip the parents. 
to equip parents to impress biblical principles in their child's life every single day. The church equips uh, entire households to function as extensions of the church, where each family becomes a sermon to the world. So it doesn't, it doesn't just start and end with your family. It's a much bigger process. It's a much bigger cause, and we'll get to that as we uh, continue this message. The church equips by bridging the gaps between children's ministry, youth ministry, young adult ministry, and senior ministry. So it's creating a less fragmented church. Oftentimes you go to different churches, and I'm sure it happens here, it happens everywhere, that there's so many different ministries in the church that the church has become just extremely segregated into its own pockets of believers, its own ministries. And very rarely does the church come together as one with a common goal. So oftentimes the church looks like this. There's the adult ministry, the young adult ministry, the youth ministry, the senior ministry, and they don't touch, they don't interact. They're their own separate domains. But as the family minister, I am to work with these ministries in such a way that they all touch, that they all interact with one another. Because each ministry involves a family member in your home. So we don't want to fragment the church, but we want to make the church more connected, not only in our corporate assemblies, but also in the home. Amen? Amen. Family ministry is not just acknowledging that parents are the primary disciple makers. It's not just the church equipping parents to minister to their children in the home, but it also involves discipling. Discipling. Discipleship is defined as a personal and intentional process in which Christians guides unbelievers and less mature believers to embrace and apply the gospel in every part of their lives. Furthermore, it is the gospel expressed and applied in the context of the community and the home. The goal for discipleship is conformity to Christ. Conformity to Christ. It's not just about spreading the gospel. It's not just about having our children obey the gospel. It's a wonderful thing to have. It's a wonderful thing to know that you've raised your child in such a way that they want to be baptized, have their sins forgiven, have an unconditional relationship with God, but it doesn't end there. They have to be discipled along the way. Parents and caregivers are the disciple makers. It is our job as parents to make disciples out of our children. But the reality is parents can't do or they can't give what they don't have. A lot of parents aren't making disciples of their children because they first have not become disciples. Amen, church. When you look at Deuteronomy chapter 6, in verse 6, it says, And these words which I command today shall be in your heart. He's talking to the adults. He's talking to those who parent children, to those who have grandchildren. He's saying, the word of God must first be in you. It must first penetrate you in order for it to have an effect on your child. In order for you to give your child what they need spiritually, you must first have obtained it yourself. I encourage parents today, examine your relationship with God. Examine your commitment to God. The truth is, your child will adopt your faith. There's always exceptions where a child may totally lose faith or their faith becomes stronger than yours. But generally speaking, 
the child adopts the faith of the parent. And I hear a lot of parents say, after I, after I ask the question, you know, do you want your child to have your faith? No, of course not. I want my child to have a faith that is bigger and better and stronger than mine. Well, how would they know to do that? They only know what they observe. In one of the books, The DNA of D6, it talks about this, this fraction, 1 over 168. 1 over 168. 1 over 168. What does that mean? In one week, there's 168 hours. For your average churchgoer, for your committed churchgoer, that means you're spending... On average, one hour a week, let's say you just come to worship on Sunday mornings, you and your child, on average, one hour a week of biblical teaching in comparison to the 168 hours that remain. How can you make a disciple that way? And this is how the hours are broken down, according to the book. Out of a 168-hour week, children spend one hour of biblical teaching, 49 hours of sleep, 45 hours of electronic use, 35 hours of school, which only leaves parents with an average of five hours per day to spend with your child. That's not including preparing meals, paying bills, going grocery shopping, commute time, So once you factor in all of that in homework, you really only have a small block of influence when it comes to your child's faith. We're talking about an hour a day on average. Disciples aren't made that way. It has to be a better way to do family ministry. It has to be a better way to instill biblical teachings into our children. Discipling children is not isolated to acts, acts of Christianity. It's deeper than that. Discipling children involves intentional, everyday interaction. It's not merely changing behaviors. That's superficial. We're talking about changing the family's mindset, changing the family's culture, changing the family's generational dysfunctions, changing the philosophies of the family not just the behavior. Today, devout Christians, devout, I'm using the term loosely, let's say they spend on average three hours a week listening to lectures and biblical concepts and teachings. So that would mean Sunday morning, Bible class. That would mean the presentation during worship, which we're doing now. That would also mean Wednesday evenings. So that's three hours of biblical teachings. Is that enough? No. We've bought into the idea that that's enough, but it's not. And they said, why do you say that, Brother Josh? Well, when you look at Jesus and his disciples, did Jesus spend three hours a week with his disciples? No. He spent every day with his disciples. He ate with them. He played with them. He lived with them. He slept with them. He did everyday life with them. He taught them at every opportunity that, that he had. He didn't waste an opportunity to teach them about the kingdom, to teach them about God, to teach them about spirituality. He used everyday interactions to teach them biblical truths. And guess what? Living with these with these men every day for at least three years, they still had unbelief, right? They still struggled with their faith. They still had to be rebuked. If these people that Jesus lived with, if they didn't have it all together and they lived with them, how in the world can we think that three hours a day will make a disciple? It doesn't. Family ministry is teaching parents and caregivers how to disciple their children every day of the week. (laughs) 
Here's another result of the assessment I sent home. It says, how many times in the past two months has my family engaged in any family devotionals or worship in the home? Mind you, these are people sitting right here with you. These aren't just some people out in the world in another state that we'll never have connection with. These are people that you see every day. And these are the results. 47% said never. Now this is coming from Christians. 47% says I have never had a family devotional in my home. When I was growing up, I didn't have them either. I didn't know you can do such a thing. I didn't know we were allowed to. That's the the, the stark reality is that these are Christians. We're Christians, and many of us are not engaging in any type of spirituality in our home, but we'll say that we're Christians. We'll say that we're followers of Christ, and I'm not trying to down anyone because this is just where our culture is. And this lets me know that I may be here for a while, Job security. (laughs) And number four, family ministry is evangelizing. Evangelizing. The goal is to equip and encourage families to be so Christ-centered that their faith is not only passed from one generation to the next, but each family is a living sermon that preaches Christ to the world. There's an article or maybe a video element by Francis Chan that recently was released, and some of you may have seen it on uh, Facebook. And it talks about how parents idolize their family, more so how parents idolize their children. And they believe that their ministry is solely to evangelize their children. And so that's what they stick with. They put everything else on, on the back burner when it comes to spirituality. And they hone it and they just focus in on their family exclusively, neglecting the larger population. And I want to say that ministering to, their, to the family, yes, that's the core concept of family ministry, but it doesn't end there. It begins there. And then the family, in turn, ministers to other families. In Psalms chapter 78, beginning at verse 4, it says, We will not hide them from their descendants. We will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord, His power and the wonders He has done. He decreed statutes for Jacob and established the law in Israel which he commanded our ancestors to teach their children. So the next generation, get this, would know them, even the children yet to be born. And they, in turn, will tell their children. Then they would put their trust in God and would not forget his deeds, but would keep his commandments. Wow. Evangelism. This is evangelism. Where what you do with your child now, the faith that you instill in them because of your faith, will have a trickle-down effect where it affects not only your children, but your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren. That's pretty awesome. So evangelize your grandchildren by first discipling your children. If there's anyone in here who would like to have grandchildren one day, and if you're here, I'm assuming that you want them to have a wonderful, profound faith, well, do something with their parents now, your children. Amen. Amen. Our goal is to send our children out into the world with a message. An author by the name of Neil Postman says this. 
He said, children are the living messages we send to a time we will not see. As we raise our children, we're sending them out into the world with a message. But that message is determined by the home environment that we set up for them. Sometimes we send our children into the world with a message that is so against Christianity. We send them with a message in believing that divorce is okay. We send them out preaching a message to the world that contradicts our faith because we have not lived a committed life to Christ when they were with us. In Acts chapter 2, verse 38, in verse 39, scripture we're all familiar with. As Peter was preaching on the day of Pentecost, he says, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. But it doesn't stop there. He says, The promise, this promise, is for you and your children. And also for those who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. So here's the idea, is that yes, first you evangelize and you minister to your children. And you uh, set it up in such a way that they respond to the gospel. But the gospel is not just for you and your family, but it's for other families. So you first focus on your family so you can then evangelize another family. That's family ministry. Here's another finding from the members here. How many times in the past year have I participated with one or more of my children in witnessing or inviting a non-Christian to church? Well, you see what the green says. 47%. Never. Never. Never have I even thought. Can you hear me now? Hey, there we go. Unfortunately, we never think about evangelizing. There we go. All right evangelizing other people's children. We have to start thinking bigger and better than our family. Let me help this make sense. There's a video I want to show you, and I think Sesame Street does a great job in teaching us about this concept of ministering to our family and then to others. That's Grover. It won't go? No? Oh, there we go. This is your old pal, Grover. And today, I'm going to talk to you about near and far. In fact, I, little furry Grover, am going to show you near and far. Okay, here goes. First, this is near. Right here, near. This is far! This is near. You see? Oh, okay, I'll do one more for you, okay? Okay. This is near. again. Okay? You want to see it one more time? Oh, sure, I'm not doing anything. 
Okay, it is near. This is far. This is near. You got that, huh? You don't have that. Okay, this is near. All right, hopefully you get the idea. So family ministry is reaching those who are near to us. That's our family, that's our children, that's our grandchildren. Maybe it's our spouse. And then it's reaching those who are far. Near and far. Thank you, Grover. In conclusion, Family Ministry's goal is to give parents and caregivers a deep conviction and knowing that they are primarily responsible for discipling their children. Furthermore, the goal is to equip and encourage families to be so Christ-centered that their faith is not only passed from one generation to the next, but each family is a living sermon that preaches Christ to the world. As we close this morning, Just know that there is a family ministry team that exists, and we're working with that team to be an extension of me, of the family ministry. And once that team has uh, been solidified and put together correctly, I will present them to you. Um, but I just want you to think about your relationship with your, with your child, with your children, with your grandchildren. And I want you to ask yourself, have I been imparting the spiritual concepts and spiritual truths? Have I been living a life for them in such a way that I am willing to say that I want my child to adopt my faith? That I want my grandchild to adopt my faith? Maybe you hadn't gotten there yet, and I ask you and I plead with you, let today be the day that you make that commitment to Christ. Because just bringing them here to be taught is not enough. It has to be more than that. And if you allow me to, I will partner with you in helping your family to be an outpost of the church, to be a lighthouse in the community so that your family can live life in such a way that evangelizes the entire world. And I want you to know that there's no such thing as a perfect family. Amen. Amen. There's no such thing as a perfect family. So we should not expect for every family to be perfect. In fact, when we take a really deep look into God's word, he operates very well with broken families. And he uses the brokenness of families to teach us about him and his attributes and about Christianity. And I know there are broken families here. There are broken families in the world. There are broken families across the street from us. We ought not to look down on them, but we ought to encourage them. Amen? We ought to pray for them. We ought to love them. And we need to realize we don't have it all together ourselves. If you're here this morning and you need to repent of anything, if you're here this morning and you need prayer, you need strength, you need encouragement, let that be known as we all together stand and sing the song of invitation.